Anyway, I'm going to be talking about uh, peripheral nervous system. Um, the reason the peripheral nervous system is so important is because it allows us to receive and transmit information from our external environment to our central nervous system and brain. And then it also allows our brain to send signals back out to our organs, uh, glands, and uh, lets us basically know where we are in space and how to interact with our environment. Um, implications of PNS on the CNS is they say that over 80% of the input coming into our central nervous system up into our brain is um, from our muscle spindles. So when we have disadvantation from subluxation or impingement or what have you, um, you're basically deaffrontating that part of the brain. And what, a, what does a nerve need to survive? Somebody go ahead and tell me. Yeah. So we need stimulation, we need fuel from glucose, and we need oxygen. So if we're getting deaffrontated, we're losing that stimulation, and then it's the use it or lose it principle, basically those neurons are going to start to break down. Um, and that can create a, things like hemispherosity, and we'll talk all about that stuff later, but implications can be seen all over the nervous system just from simple affrontation, that's why we're in school. Um, our job, number one, I don't think we talk about this enough, is just to observe to see what we see and don't see something that isn't there. So we're talking about PNS today. So usually when you think about PNS and you want to test the PNS, what, what would you think that your test would be? Somebody? Anyone? Anybody? Say a question. If you're going to test the peripheral nervous system, any kind of peripheral nerves, what kind of test would you do? Yeah, you do muscle testing, you do sensory testing, stuff like that. But really, the first thing you could do to see if it's a peripheral lesion is just to take a look at the muscles that that nerve innervates to see if there's wasting there. Because with an upper motor neuron lesion or a central lesion, you won't see wasting. You will see wasting with peripheral nerve lesions, and that's how you can differentiate just from looking. <coughs> just like looking at the eyes, don't see something that isn't there. Uh, don't make something up just because that's what you want that diagnosis to be. The more you work at it, the come back to it, you'll figure out what it really is. Okay, that's just my little spiel, anyway. Um, second, we need to understand the structure and the function of the PNS and how it connects to the central nervous system and the implications of what happens when there's dysfunction on one in relationship to the other one. Um, third thing is make a working diagnosis thing is you don't have to be right the first time. You just you make your diagnosis, you do an intervention, and then you retest. And if what you did was the correct thing, then the test you performed before should be better. And you know if your treatment was appropriate or not. Um, so let's get into a little bit of the anatomy. I know this stuff's dry, but it is the PNS, and uh, we do need to know it, so it's all good. Anyway, what makes a nerve? Um, it's made of unmyelinated or myelinated axons, uh, the connective sheaths that connect them together, um, fat, and local blood vessels, which is called the vasonerborn. Now, this can have implications because since the peripheral nerves are made mostly of fats in between everything else, diet is a huge thing uh, with people and peripheral nerve problems. So if somebody's got a crappy diet, and they're having problems with numbness and tingling in a certain limb or something like that, just telling them to eat the right kind of foods and the right kind of fats could definitely help them at least regenerate and start to get function back in that peripheral nerve or, or whatever you're talking about. Um, okay, so there's three parts to each peripheral nerve. There's a sensory part, a motor part, and an autonomic part. Um, we're going to get into autonomics later, so mostly I'm just going to focus on the sensory and motor part for today and tomorrow. Um, so there's three layers of peripheral nerves that cover the nerve. we got the epi epineurium, which is um, basically the outer covering of the nerve, which um, protects the nerve against compression. 
So that kind of also plays into the fact that we know today the subluxation is not so much of a compression on a nerve because it has that protection from the epimerian most of the time. Um, it's more of a deaffectative model that we're following. Um, second, we have the perineurium, which is the nerve blood barrier. It's kind of like the brain blood barrier, but except it's in the peripheral nervous system. And uh, another thing to note about PNS, it doesn't have any bone to protect it, so it's definitely susceptible to more chemical and physical injury. That's why we need to know. We need to know it really well. And I've heard from neurodocs that I've talked to that it's PNS is one of the basic things that we need to know, and it's like it's overlooked a lot. And people get to boards and they do great on the CNS part, and not so well on the PNS part. So just food for thought. Um, then you have the endoneurium, and that's just basically the covering of the each axon itself. Okay, so what else do we have here? Okay, the role of myelin. So you have myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. Um, basically, the unmyelinated fibers are still myelinated, but it's just a bunch of nerves myelinated by one big sheath instead of one myelin sheath wrapping around itself and creating more and more and more insulation. So the more insulated a nerve is, the faster the impulses are going to be that go through that nerve. Which is why when we do have disadvantation from a subluxation or something like that, you lose the afferents from your muscle spindles. And one of the jobs of the muscle spindles is to come into the cord and to block the pain signals that are continually firing from everywhere in your body, which are slower signals. So when you lose the really fast signals that come in and block the pain signals, you get that constant pain that a lot of people we see with back problems and uh, all sorts of pain problems for a long time experience. Okay. So what happens when we do have a compression on the nerve? Does anybody know some of the physiologic processes that happens? Valerian degeneration? Yeah, that's one. Well, Valerian degeneration. So what is Valerian degeneration? Uh, it's when there's compression on a nerve and the part distal to that begins to essentially break apart, break down. Yep, yep exactly. And then there's also a different process that takes place proximal to the lesion, which is called chromatolysis. And that's basically breakdown of the internal parts of the nerve, set, uh, swelling of the cell body and just um, the nerve goes to more of a reparative kind of meta metabolic state instead of a functional metabolic state. And I think they said, what did they say? Uh, with Valerian degeneration, the base, basement membrane is, it stays there, the myelin breaks down, the outer coating breaks down, but the um, the basement membrane stays there unless the nerve is completely cut. So you can have regeneration of a nerve, what is it, like one millimeter a month or something? Okay, so that can just give you a time frame on how long a patient patient's care would take. You know, if it's, if it's up here and getting well earned degeneration down here, take a measurement and you're like, okay, millimeter, centimeter a month, and that gives you kind of a, a timeline. So, um, what else do we have here? Okay, so another thing that they go over is the Sunderland class, classification of nerve injury. Um, it's a scale of basically one to five, and that just tells you the severity of the, um, the nerve lesion. Um, you have one, which is neuropraxia, which just means there's basically compression on the nerve. Um, you have second degree, which is exonomesis, which there's already been some compression, and now there's starting to be some myelin breakdown. Uh, you have third degree, fourth degree, and fifth degree is complete neuropraxia, which is just complete cutting of the nerve itself, and you aren't going to have any help there with anything if the nerve is cut. You can't really put that nerve back together. Um, so that's basically all I needed to talk about today. Now I'm just going to give you something you can take away. Um, we all know that we have to learn the brachial plexus, unfortunately. It's a pain. But uh, 
there's, we learned a really easy way to learn how to draw it and memorize it. So I'll teach you guys how to do that really quick. And then I guess tomorrow we're going to go over more of the, um, the clinical aspects, like testing and what to look for and how peripheral nerve lesions can really um, play into brain dysfunction and stuff like that. Sound good? All right. So, drawing the brachial plexus. Who remembers how to do that? Anyone? <laughs> anyway, I, I don't that well, but I learned how to do this, and uh, it makes it super easy. So, so with the way of drawing it, the way they teach is you got to remember there's a rule of threes. So there's four sets of threes you got to remember when you're drawing the brachial plexus. So first of all, you have three rocket ships. Right. <laughs> three rocket, not just rocket ships, rocket ships with laser beams coming out of the front. <laughs> so first of all, you have two rocket ships going one way. Ship firing the laser beam back at the other two. Okay, so then um, there's just a few things you need to know, just basics when you're drawing it anyway. You need to know that it starts at T5 and ends at T1. So once you draw your rocket ships, you want to draw your spinal cord or your spinal nerve buckles. So we got C5, C6. Seven, C8, and T1. Okay. Now, we already did our first set of threes. Now, the other thing you got to remember about the brachial plexus is there's a W, an X, and a Y in the, in the uh, brachial plexus. So first of all, we will start with our W. And our W comes here on the end. And that's what's going to turn into our terminal branches. And then here is your X. And then attached to that X is Y. <coughs> now, now you have your general basic structure of the brachial plexus, which it seems super complicated, but when you break it down into little kid terms like that, it's really not too bad. OK, so after that, you start with your sets of threes. So each major level of the brachial plexus is going to have three different nerves coming off each thing that you need to remember. So right here is where you're going to put your first three. Okay. And then this first one here, well, first of all, let's do the terminal branches. And this stuff you're just going to need to so right here we have the, let's do a cutaneous nerve. You have your median nerve, your ulnar nerve, your radial nerve, and your axillary nerve. Okay. And then your first set of threes right here, coming off the root C5, your root dorsal scap. You have your suprascapular nerve. And you have your lateral sexual nerve. Okay. And then you come down to your next level, and then you do your next set of threes. So then you have on this set of threes, you have your um, subscapular nerves. You have your upper subscap, you have your lower subscap, and then Come back to that one. Long what is it? Is it long thoracic? No. Or thoracodorsal. Thoracodorsal, yeah. Okay. And then down here, you're going to have another set of three. And that is going to be your medial pectoral, your medial brachial. 
brachial cutaneous and your medial anti brachial cutaneous. Um, so that's that's the basics right there, and then you can add some more on from there because there's definitely more stuff to the brachial plexus. Like you need to know from your C5, C6, C7 roots, you connect those together. And you got your long thoracic nerve. Oh, I guess that's your other set of threes. And um, that's basically it. And then you need to know where you need to know that you got your roots, roots, trunks. What's it? Roots, trunks. Randy Travis drinks cold beer. Randy Travis. I was thinking Ricky Bobby from Tommy Day and Night. Ricky Bobby. <laughs> so you have your roots. Roots, trunks, divisions, chords, and then terminal branches. And then this one would be your um, your medial cord. I mean your, uh, your medial cord, lateral cord, posterior, posterior, anterior divisions, posterior divisions. Anyway, that's just. Um, sometimes they're drawn different, but yeah. uh, I don't think they're drawing branches from one of those peripheral nerves. They can be different. Gotcha. Okay. So, we got eight minutes. Does anybody want to try and come do it? The way I can. <laughs> For reason? No takers? Jess? <laughs> anyway, does anyone want me to go over slowly how to do it again, just to make it easy? Nobody? Sure. sure. Yeah. Cool. 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 They made us do this, I think, what, like 15 times when we were in the module, so it's like, it becomes such second nature the more you drive. Seriously. And then there's a, there's a um, what is there, there's a program called Draw to Know It. You sign up. And you really want to learn how to draw these pathways, which you are going to need to do if you want. If you're serious about this neuro program, you draw, take two pathways a week, and you just draw that over and over and over again, and you never forget. Them. So it's awesome. But let's do this one more time. And if anybody wants to review this, uh, we're videotaping this. This is going to be up on the website. If you guys haven't went to our website. We have a Facebook page for functional neurology, and we're putting up all these uh, videos. So if you want to review one thing, go over what we talked about today. Go check it out. All right, one more time, quick. Three rocket ships. With lasers on the front. Two going one way, one shooting back at the others. Have your rocket ships, you add your W, X, or w X, and Y. So you got your W, X, and your Y. Um, you just got to hallucinate. <laughs> all, you do, all you're doing is you're adding this extra little branch right here. So it's on the it's on the further part of the X, and you're adding that back there. Okay, then you can do your osteocutaneous, your median, ulnar, radial, axillary. Now you start adding your branches of threes. So you got three here, three here, three here, and then three here connecting one nerve. So the three that connect into one nerve from the three branches are uh, long thoracic nerve, dorsal scap, super scap, lateral pectoral, uh, subscap, upper and lower, your thoracodorsal, 
medial pectoral, um, medial brachial cutaneous, and medial antibrachial cutaneous. I don't think I don't think it matters that much to tell you no. the truth. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They have it in the module. What? In the module that have uh, radar right axillary so it's like. When you think about it on a person too, you just gotta know where it is. So this just gives you a tool to learn the basics, you know. Anyway, that's it. And then tomorrow we're gonna go over um, more of the clinical stuff. So muscle testing, reflexes, and implications on the CNS.